8,290 new games launched on Steam in 2019. That's an average of 22 new games launching every day. And at the beginning of 2020, there were over 34,000 total games on Steam. Add to that an estimated 265,000 available games on the App Store. So, as you can see, the massive number of available games screaming for attention makes it more important than ever for us game developers to really understand how do we find our target audience. So, applying some of the principles and tools I will share in this talk can actually mean the difference between your game completely missing the mark versus your game truly living up to the innermost wants of the target audience, ultimately making people love your game. So if that sounds interesting to you, I have something to share. So I'm Jacob Jorstedt. I'm a product marketing manager at Paradox Interactive. I was asked to hold this talk at Future Games. And of course, during the current circumstances, that means a recorded talk. So I'm currently based in Stockholm, Sweden. And I've spent the last six years in the entertainment and video games industry at Paradox, at Walt Disney Company, and working on brands like, for example, Soy Mars, Wyoming the Aftermath, Disney, uh, Disney Pixar Cars 3, The Incredibles, Toy Story, uh, as well as a couple of unannounced projects. So I'm excited to give back to the industry and, you know, talk some about uh, target audience research today. So what to expect in this short 30 minute talk? Well, there's a lot of general market research information out there, uh, but not all of it is relevant to the games industry. I mean, you should all know that there's these fast-moving consumer goods companies that are spending billions of dollars each year on researching things like uh, toothpaste dental habits, but that does not necessarily make their approach to target audience research very relevant to us. So I'm usually the first one to say that like the games industry is not a unique snowflake industry, um, but in this talk my goal is very much to keep the research tools I share with you as you know industry relevant as possible. Um, secondly, let's keep it practical. I want to give you tools that you can try out on your own projects straight away. So these are actually the tools and principles that I wish that I had when I was starting out. So hopefully they can be of use to you too. Um, also, uh, a tool being free and statistically airtight is quite a rare combination. So take findings with a pinch of salt. Um, Market research produces estimates and clues that, you know, aid your decision. Uh, it's not irrevocable truths. Remember, remember also that um, tools, platforms, and circumstances, they change all the time. So they may appear or disappear quite quickly, and we'll be exploring a specific case, uh, again, to make things practical for what exists now in September of 2020. All right, so here are the steps we'll go through beginning with why and when, like why should you even bother doing market research? Then we'll get uh, practical with something called Project Red Panda. We'll look at the scenario when you basically have zero marketing dollars, what should you do then? Then we'll look at the medium scenario, you have some budget and are really looking for value for money in terms of research. Then we'll look at the fully loaded scenario where you really are out to maximize your knowledge. And then we'll end with a summary. So starting off with why and when. So why even bother? Why do target audience research for game, games? And like, when should you start doing it? So first of all, it's about reducing risk. So I mean, and as you saw in the introduction, like there's a ton of games being released. So making games is already quite risky. So why not reduce that risk by actually understanding your target audience, understanding what the potential, uh, what is the sales potential? Will you be able to meet the, uh, the expectations of your target audience? So it's a way of managing risk, really. Secondly, um, avoid wasting money, like making your marketing dollars actually go towards, uh, you know, engaging and converting the uh, your true fans. So if you're making a hardcore RTS strategy game, um, you want to spend those dollars reaching that very target audience. Um, if you're, you know, targeting too broadly to, you know, Japanese visual novel fans, that will be a waste of money, most likely. Uh, so by understanding your target audience, you will avoid wasting money. And thirdly, uh, I recommend starting immediately. So 
game idea and research, they really go together. Um, so you can avoid pursuing an idea that doesn't really have the potential that you may think it has. So do your research immediately and kind of understand an opportunity and uh, yeah. So um, to make things practical, let's use a fictitious project uh, as a reference to better understand uh, how some other research tools can be applied. So Project Red Panda is an early stage idea pitched by an experienced, uh, experienced game dev team. So uh, it's a thematic single player mix of RTS and base building set in the Caribbean pirate era. So it's entering the niche established by games like Northgard, They Are Billions, Age of Empires, and that, those types of games. Um, and it's a single player game launching on PC and Mac. And again, it's, a, it's an example, it's not a real project. It's useful for our purposes today. So moving on to what can you really do with zero marketing dollars? Uh, maybe you're a small indie studio starting out or you just wanna understand your target audience better. Um, so my first kind of thinking around this that the games industry is really not lacking ideas. It's lacking a capacity to take an idea and bring that idea into a completed launchable game. So I sometimes talk to developers who they're worried about there being other games in the genre niche that they are planning to launch. And, and I'm here to say that that's okay. It's actually more than okay. I mean, it will give you a much better understanding of the existing target audiences. And it's a data point also showing what degree of success these uh, previous games have had. So don't be too worried about that. It's, it's okay, really. Because with zero dollars for marketing research, it really starts with your competitors. So learning everything you can possibly learn about them. So once you've found one or two games that have a basic overlapping feature sets, uh, at least when it comes to player fantasy or features, and so on, um, it's time to really dig deeper. And one tool that is useful as a starting point is this uh, cool visualization tool by um, Anvaka Andre Kashka, I think is the pronunciation is uh, on GitHub. Uh, it utilizes Google's autocomplete of searches. So it's actually a really nice way of understanding what games are people actually comparing our competitor with. So instead of making just um, educated guesses, this tool actually shows how online search behavior um, has emerged for the titles. Um, so, you know, when you put in the North Guard versus, you get a ton of suggestions, and you can do that pretty much for any game. Um, and that's uh, actual online user behavior, and this visualizes this in a quite useful way, which uh, at least as a starting point. Cool. So next up, you can look at uh, interest over time. So uh, Google Trends is a, a free tool that could be a good starting point. And uh, what you'll find is that there are spikes and uh, your job is really to investigate what caused these spikes. So did they release that week or was it a trailer, expansion perhaps? And how was that received? How does that compare to the other data that you have collected? And this is very much hands-on investigative work, especially if you don't have any budget. Um, you can also do some comparisons. So what's the interest level compared to this other game? Um, but as you'll see, it's, a, it's an index. So it's a maximum of 100. It's not, you know, hard numbers of searches. Um, so yeah, you can make comparisons. You can see over time. Uh, but to get the hard data, you'll have to uh, use some other tools, which we'll talk about later. So when it comes to competitor analysis, uh, there are a couple of ways to go about this. Uh, I like to start with versions and price. So do they bundle it in a special way? Have they run discounts? What's the price level? And how does that work with the price that you have in mind? I also recommend looking at reactions. What's the review sentiment? What do the reviews actually say? Um, what's the community sentiment in the forums and on social media? And what are some of the frequent pain points that come up? This can give some really interesting, you know, insights into your target audience, what they think and so on. I also recommend looking at trailers and creative. So this can give you insights into what style the target audience prefers, but you know, it's important to look at the reactions, for example, at trailers to see if they really resonated with the target audience. Also look at languages. Uh, this can sometimes give a hint of what marker 
uh, what markets the competitor at least uh, has seen as important enough to uh, localize language for. Um, and lastly, when it comes to sales, you can actually make some uh, educated guesses and rough estimates when it comes to sales, which we'll be looking at now. So when it comes to estimating sales numbers and top markets, there are some useful tools for you know, when, you're, when you're on a shoestring budget. Um, and it's very important to not take everything on these sites as 100% true. They do deviate quite heavily, but as I've said before, these are rough estimates that you can use if you don't have a budget to access better data. Um, so they attribute and estimate in uh, different ways. And you know, that is beyond the scope of this lecture. Just be aware of that and you can look closer at how each of the tools calculates it. So most of these are free. Some have paid versions that are quite cheap, uh, pledging on Patreon, for example, like Steam Spy. Um, GameStat is uh, useful for estimating console numbers. I have Solinome for Twitch statistics over time and also gives a hint about languages so the channels playing a game. Um, Steam Scout can also be used to understand uh, where are the reviews coming from, from which countries and by extension where the players are located. You can also have a look at the number of reviews of a game uh, and rough that you can kind of use that as a rough comparative benchmark for understanding sales volume between games. Um, so lastly, this is not a complete list. Sites like this, they, they pop up, they change their axis and sometimes completely disappear. So um, these tools are available now in September of 2020, but you know, that may very well change at any time. And if you use the free versions of this, do follow the links uh, with other sites to you know, support these creators on Patreon. They are really awesome for sharing with this with the game dev community and they deserve your backing. All right, so what about the medium scenario when you do have some budget, but are still very much looking to invest that wisely? Um, so digging deeper into some of the competitor titles is really where it's at. So, there are some research platforms that have compiled uh, databases that you can access for a fee. So Quantic Foundry is one of these. Um, it's a game analytics company that runs a service that can be quite useful as a starting point, at least for the medium-sized projects kind of. So by inserting the competitors uh, for Project Red Panda, we can you know, identify things like age groups, gender, how much they play, which gamer category, what are they motivated by? Is it, you know, the completion of the game? Is it the story elements? Is, the, is it the strategy or the community, perhaps? Um, so you can also get a sense of what other games they like to play and also which games do they not tend to play that otherwise are quite popular. Um, so with this one, I'm not allowed to show you screenshots of the actual research dashboard, but it's visualized in a quite simple, intuitive way that allows you to customize and dig deeper. Um, so here are some examples of insights that we can make from certain competitor titles. Uh, it's information that will really help us understand demographics, how they play, and begins to flesh out who they are, really. And uh, lastly, Quantic Foundry is, of course, not the only platform offering this. There are lots of options in different price ranges, and I encourage you to compare and browse. Ultimately, understanding how real people are behaving online is going to take you a lot closer to the truth about your target audience. Um, and that begins with uh, keyword research. It's something I did a lot of when I worked in e-commerce, but it has plenty of use in the games industry as well. It's mainly to understand how big is the audience and what are they specifically looking for. So Google enables all their ad accounts that have ads running to see statistics of how many people are searching for keywords in any given month. So naturally, understanding how many people are actively searching for a competitor brand over time gives insights into the audience size and trends and so on. Um, search volume also reveals a breakdown of countries and platforms. It's uh, essential when estimating uh, what your top countries are for your target audience. I recommend following that up with uh, real ad experiments, so testing your findings and assumptions from before. And it will take a little bit of your time setting up these solid uh, verifiable tests, but once you do, the ad data 
really comes quick and you can gain valuable insights at a rather low cost actually. So that can be everything from simple things like which interest groups uh, show most engagement when they're exposed to your game or even to advanced testing of like 30 different versions of your game cover art. And it doesn't even have to be a real existing product. You can just link to your coming soon mockup page with some options to learn more. So this type of testing is definitely standard for mobile and they have great mobile specific options. So we don't have really the time to go into depth on here. Um, the reason I have Google ads and Facebook here and not the very latest, you know, trending social media is simply because it's, uh, it's rare that these new platforms have managed to build up their backends enough to run reliable testing and they often do not have really the detailed enough targeting options. So I'm not saying that these are the only platforms. Uh, these are just solid starting points to begin your experimentation with. The final note on uh, you know, the real world experiments with the target audience is to remember to run the experiments long enough so you actually have a decent number of people interacting with your ad because Know, without enough data, the whole experiment is simply not worth doing. So by now, you should start grouping these players into player segments that you can conclude are likely to be interested in your game. So I recommend identifying the core first, so finding that niche and um, you know finding the interested, the passionate fans, and then working your way outward. Um, so identifying the more broad target audience groups later, you know, um, that are worth targeting once you've already reached engagement and converted with the innermost core groups. So for Project Red Panda, we could, for example, identify hardcore RTS strategy fans as the inner core, and then expanding into broader strategy fans, and finally the broad PC players. Uh, and as you learn more and kind of fill out the information that you have, you can expand these into what we call personas. So personas can be a great tool for someone to get the gist of what the target audience is without necessarily reading through your whole 50 page slide presentation with every little detail. It's a good way to get everyone on the same page of uh, what are the different groups that we are targeting and how do we talk about them. Um, I recommend giving them memorable names so people can easily <laughs> reference them. I mean, it's a lot easier to remember hardcore warmongers or achieving architects rather than A, B, or C. So for Project Red Panda, here's a very basic version of uh, how one of the personas could look, the, the hardcore warmongers. So let's say we find, found out that they really like the, uh, the competitive aspect of uh, conquering other bases in RTS, so um, they're not so keen on trading and collaboration aspects, and uh, they really seem to like the balancing of units and min-maxing their approach. We also list that they find out about games via YouTube and Twitch, uh, game reviews, and are heavy users of Reddit. And as for shopping, they buy most of their games on Steam, they don't really like cosmetics, and uh, often wait for holiday sales to by lots of games. So obviously there's a lot more that we know just in this example, but this is to show you how you can make it easily digestible. So people will avoid reading your 50 page research report, but happily read uh, four to five slides with just the, you know, distilling the core findings in an easy way. Cool, so what about the scenario when you actually have a lot of budgets where you're looking to uh, maximize knowledge? So that starts with being specific. So start with listing decisions that you need to make based on this research. And uh, this will guide what type of research you should invest in. So knowing what you want, by what date, um, will first of all make it easier to understand if you know, are these research companies in fact capable enough? Number one, are they able to recruit enough respondents of the target audience that you have identified? And number two, how do they compare in terms of uh, price, deliverables, and so on? Um, usually, the more narrow your target audience, the pricier it gets, but that could be well worth it to get specific answers. And this goes for methodology as well. So question how they run their tests so you understand and trust how they, how they run things. 
also take the time to shop around and speak to several about your research needs now, but also going forward, uh, showing that you're you know, long term and uh, that they have an interest in collaborating with you uh, on the long haul, haul as well. Um, you can request a breakdown of the cost. So how does it all add up? So, you know, what's the cost of recruitment? What's the cost of uh, the analysis and so on? I would also say that price is not everything. If they're not willing to budge on the total price, there may be you know, extra test components that they can throw in or even uh, package deals with multiple tests that you can work out together. The findings, uh, first of all, also need to be presented in an intuitive, understandable way. So the agency should you know, already be doing this, this but um, if they're not, make sure to stay on them until they do. Um, often they can also host presentation sessions uh, where you bring in the whole team, you can ask follow-up questions on the results and so on. Um, the next step is to actually incorporate the results uh, in the marketing strategy that you have started um, drafting, hopefully. Um, but it's, it's all about like, what do these findings actually mean and what practical uh, applications does it have for the community manager, for the ad optimizations agency, for the PR rep and so on. Uh, basically everyone involved in marketing of your product. It's easy enough just to point to a deck, but that's not enough. That's why educating the team and making it digestible in the form of, for example, memorable personas is so important. Many of these research companies also uh, publish reports uh, that give top level insights, uh, but to get the full reports, you often have to pay sometimes quite substantial amounts of money to access them. Um, can be worth it if you expect the report findings to be very relevant to your game or to your business case. Um, I mean, we're often talking over a thousand dollars for one report, up to a uh, hundred thousand dollars for access, you know, per, per year for access to a data platform just to set a benchmark. The good news is that if you have the budget, these uh, consultants can help you with very customized solutions. So deciding, designing a study that uh, specifically recruits participants, uh, playing your competitor games and uh, you know, providing things like perhaps video recordings of deep interviews, really drilling into like what are the specific asks that you have of the target audience. And towards the later stages of the game, they can even help you do things like game evaluation, mock reviews, to see where your game would likely end up on a Metacritic scale. So these companies, they, they do keep, you know, kind of keep evolving their service offering and platforms and, and so on. So it's worth uh, keeping an eye out and investigating several and seeing which of them actually have an offering that suits both your needs and your budget. It's also good to have an understanding of your toolbox when it comes to investing uh, this, you know, your budget into research. And uh, it can be looked at four different dimensions, really. So on the vertical axis, we have the difference between at the top. So understanding what the players, what do the, the players actually do? So how do they behave? How do they play? So the behavioral aspects. So for Project Red Panda, you could, for example, run a play test and behaviorally examine how a selected group of players are behaving in the game. Um, so you know, in a recorded format where you can review and so on, um, you could learn stuff like how do they even understand how to combine units into formations or do they engage in combat on land or at sea and stuff like that. And at the bottom, it's about understanding what the players' opinions are, so attitudinal. Um, so it's all about you know, opinions and less about how they behave, uh, all about what their attitudes and opinions are. So for Project Red Panda, you know, you could do in-depth interviews where you could, for example, ask what do they think about the pirate theme and what do they think about the cover art? On the horizontal axis, uh, we have the difference between to the left uh, qualitative, which usually means going deep and detailed with a few select participants. Um, again, for Project Red Panda, we could, for example, invest in a 
diary study um, to understand on a deep level uh, how you know how does our target audience spend their day and how does uh, our playing you know RTS strategy games fit into that. Um, and to the right we have quantitative, which usually means going for a wide scale, so reaching a large number of participants, uh, but often at the expense of detail. So um, that could, for example, take the form of a survey that you distribute to a huge amount of people in your target audience. But of course, you can't uh, include too many questions and you're not able to ask uh, follow up questions as you could in the qualitative focus group. So summarizing things. So we began talking about why and when, so and concluded that uh, it's about reducing risk. The games industry is already risky, so making that effort into target audience, you can reduce that risk. Uh, that goes also for avoiding wasting money by making uh, you know, educated investments in reaching the right audience, um, and should really start immediately. Then we talked about uh, Panda, we introduced uh, the case and uh, applied our different tools to that case throughout the different sections. Then we looked at the zero dollar shoestring scenario where you are really looking to use uh, free useful tools to identify and evaluate competitors, you know, look at interest over time, estimating sales and uh, top countries. Then we looked at the medium scenario, um, so digging into demographics and motivations, uh, using platforms like Quadric Foundry. Um, we looked at keyword research as an option and uh, how ad experiments can really add to your knowledge. Um, we talked about the principle of starting with the core, adding secondary audiences and then expanding these into uh, personas. And lastly, we looked at uh, the fully loaded scenario, so making your big budget count through uh, being specific, negotiating, and distilling and incorporating these insights throughout your team. Uh, also touched upon the toolbox that is at your disposal and uh, how do you really ch you know, choose the right tool depending on if you want to know is behavioral or attitudinal. So what's next? Well, what's next is you trying out these things on your own projects. I hope you found this relevant to the games industry and also practical. Hopefully you found some tools that you can try out for yourself and discover and map out your next target audience. Um, so I'm reachable at jacobjorsted.com if you have any questions or comments and I'd be happy to hear from you. Thanks.